Good afternoon. This is the uh, Thursday, December 19, 2019 meeting of the Athens City Planning Commission. Uh, a quorum has been established. All members are present today. Uh, disposition of the December 5th, 2019 uh, meeting minutes. Are there any comments? Changes? I'd just like to make a motion to adopt the minutes. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Uh, there's one case uh, today, the uh, case number 19-07, City Council Resolution R-08-19, a request to consider amending zoning code to include short-term rentals in residential zones. Um, the last meeting, uh, a, uh, some recommendations were presented uh, and Member Stone introduced that. Would you care to uh, uh, follow up on the ideas you have down? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the last time we met, uh, we brought forth uh, some review of Title 23 uh, and modifications to the proposed uh, rec uh, to the proposed changes that City Council had forward to us, and I gave it to the Commission uh, with a pen and ink markup. Uh, this time, uh, we've gone ahead and, and done it in an actual Word document, so you can see. Uh, and I'll just rehash the, uh, the the changes to the changes that Council had asked us to consider um, through this. Uh, and then I will talk about some other recommendations that we have from the administration perspective and turn it over to the planner and code director to speak in more detail there. So uh, if we could start at the build beginning uh, here of Resolution 08-19 uh, of the City Council, um, we have put forth that the, uh, the change under 230401 uh, otherwise authorized here, and you can see that in bold, remains, uh, and then under uh, section 5, which would be on your second page, which would be B5, um, that we add uh, the, the sentence rentals for any duration must be annually permitted per provisions in ACC 29, which is our, our uh, housing code. Um, going forward, um, item number 10, uh, there was, a, there was a information or a section about homestay. We recommend that that be deleted. Um, conditionally permitted uses, the council had asked us to consider those uh, of tourist home and R1s, and uh, we recommend that they not uh, be included as conditionally permitted uses in R1, uh, and instead they would move and function as principally permitted uses in R3, and you see that on the uh, one, two, three, fourth page of the document that you have here. Continuing forward, um, all of the other recommended changes um, had to do with Section 5, the definitions, uh, and you can see the various uh, uh, changes uh, there in the, in the definitions. Um, if you look at the very back page of this document, uh, this is a, uh, a modification that we had initially uh, talked about last time to, to uh, Title 29-0301 uh, uh, when a rental permit is required. Um, you can disregard this last page and instead look at the more thorough recommended changes in the additional packet. It looks like this, um, which basically takes um, this one little modification of 290301 and instead uh, more fully uh, places it throughout Title 29 so that it's clear. So uh, that's what we had recommended in Title 23, the zoning code. Um, we would contend from an administration perspective that this will only be um, functional if we also have changes to the housing code and to the tax code, which are chapters 29 and chapters 15. Um, those changes are here, and I'll, I'll in a moment allow uh, um, the co-director uh, to speak to this in, in more uh, detail. 
Um, those are these, these two additional documents you see with you. Um, and, and while uh, the Planning Commission isn't necessarily charged with uh, recommending changes to other portions of the code other than the zoning code, uh, we think that these changes to the zoning code can only be accepted and, and functional if these changes to the other two codes uh, go along with it. So we would ask uh, that when the commission votes, commission would vote to uh, uh, either recommend or modify or include these changes as well. And then lastly, the last um, thing that I would contend is that the uh, uh, provisions put forth in, in uh, Title 11, which is the business regulations, uh, that, that were also part of the, uh, uh, the resolution uh, that uh, City Council took up when they forwarded us to look at the planning, uh, or I'm sorry, the zoning code, uh, were a variety of changes to the business regulations and specifically uh, talking about uh, more detailed provisions that would support the proposed changes to the zoning code. And those uh, we don't think are necessary because we think that our housing uh, code allows for all of the enforcement necessary for short-term rentals uh, through the rental permit process, which is a tried and true process that already exists. So, um, you know, that, that's in a nutshell, uh, what, as we look through this in, in detail, what we uh, think is the right way to go. Uh, if I would go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Riggs, uh, if he'd want to speak further about the specifics. Thank you. Yeah, the intent here from our from staff is to capture the uh, short-term rental uh, into our existing rental program. And we think we can do that by modifying Chapter 2903 uh, to, uh, to incorporate uh, short-term rentals in the rental dwelling and housing permit. So if you look, uh, all the changes that you see here um, for, uh, for Chapter 29, um, uh, actually, what they do is they just in, in, insert the word short-term rental just to make it clear for everybody that a permit is required for short-term rentals and um, uh, in incorporate that into our existing system. I uh, did remove, if you look at 23, uh, 2903.01, rental permit required. Um, we did remove for a period of more than six months in any calendar year, so any time anyone's going to do a short-term rental for any period of time, they're going to need a permit. Um, so the rest, if you go through here, just, in, just include short-term rentals and the rest of the definitions for this Chapter 2903. And we also included, uh, next to the last page there, a short-term rental definition, which is the same as we have in uh, Chapter 23. So those are the changes that we made to the uh, Chapter 29. And again, we think that this will we'll be able to incorporate uh, our existing system, pick up short-term rentals, uh, and, and use the same system that we have. Yeah. Uh, the administration has talked uh, in the past about uh, any penalties that might go along with violation of short-term rental proposal here. Um, could you discuss that a little bit as far as uh, is there a gradation in terms of uh, one violation after another, or? Um, we actually are gonna to try to use the same system we have for rental units. Why do we have a section in there? <clears throat> yeah, we, um, we currently have penalty systems already laid out into 29 that would still apply into the short-term rentals, um, as well as just the regular rentals. There would be, a, you know, the court process of going through the prosecutor's office for any penalties or violations that we can't get corrected, so they can follow the same pattern that already exists in Title 29. Okay. Um, and Thanks. as far as the recommendations, there is still nothing in regards to uh, prohibiting any type of short-term uh, rental in an R1? That's correct. We didn't make any changes in that. Okay. Um, uh, we, so I also have Chapter 15, uh, which is taxes. If you can, I'll just go through that real quick. Okay. Um, so we did the same thing. This is a transient guest tax, which we currently have for hotel um, and transient accommodations. So I did the same thing in Chapter 15, which is to include the definition of a short-term rental, uh, and then added that so that it's clear that uh, all short-term rentals will be required to. Uh, uh, will be responsible for a transient guest tax. Sorry. Okay. 
Um, let's, I'll go ahead and open this up for uh, discussion first from uh, the audience. And as, if you've all signed in, who wish to speak. Uh, first of all, by the way, I forgot, uh, do you, uh, if anybody who does wish to speak, if they can raise their right hand, and uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth to the Athens Planning Commission, as you know it? Thank you. Um, would someone care to uh, start the train up there? And uh, when you come up, please uh, state your name and uh, your address. Thank you. No one else. Sure, just go ahead. Yeah, my name is Steven just come up to the podium, please. And yeah, state your name and address. Thank you. My name is Stephen Sacker, and I live on Utah Place. So I live next door to a large facility that has, I won't mention anybody's name, which has been renting to weddings and to had a listing on his website about um, an Airbnb in a rather large party house. Um, we had to go to complain about it and the excess noise, etc. cetera. Uh, it caused major problems in our, in our neighborhood with the noise level because we seem to have a wedding there like every, every couple of weeks during season. Um, we've been through the planning commission session and um, it, it creates a real problem. The house next door to us has also applied for a, a short-term rental permit, and neither person is there much, okay? We have a constant flow of people and noise, and there's no regulation, to be honest with you. Uh, when we have to call the cops, which is frequent in our neighborhood because of this particular home, uh, he doesn't live there, he's there once a month, and it causes some real, real tension and stress amongst neighbors. I think personally, and given my experience with other Airbnb situations, is that you destroy the residential character of a neighborhood and a community by allowing any, any, I repeat, any short-term rentals in a neighborhood. There have been um, cities across the world where residential neighborhoods have been absolutely overrun with tourists. And we, as I've mentioned in my letter, we have enough hotels here to handle people. Um, and there's, there's no way you can regulate this stuff because no one's there and they rent their place in anyway. We know that there's a lot of cases of that in the city already. I think it's a major mistake to do that. I think we have so few residential, um, so few residential neighborhoods in our city already. We, we're the lowest, we're among the lowest in the states, I think, in terms of owner-occupied units. I think we're 30, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're at 30 or 35 percent here. Most of them are rentals anyway. Um, and I really, and I moved, I've lived in Athens, the area, for 40 years. I live in the city now, and I think it's a grave mistake, a grave mistake to open a can of worms, in my opinion. I, I think it's a big mistake. And you say that you can regulate. Well, the, 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 the bottom line is you really can't. Uh, we, had a, we had to check a website, and we found out that, yeah, they were listing Airbnbs, and they went against R1. There's no way you guys can check for everything given the personnel shortages we have in the city. Um, everybody tries the best they can, but we just don't have that sort of thing for regulation. You've got enough rental violations in this town to deal with this stuff. And I, for one, am really sick and tired of having to go over at weddings next door to ask them to keep quiet, which is what's going to happen. Um, I, I think, you know, g given the problems we already have with the students, and, uh, and I've, I've worked at OU for many years with the students and the drinking and the noise and, and the lack of regulation and the horse getting and all this stuff, you're going to start bringing them into residential neighborhoods. That are, people live there like we do. You know, we, we, we invest in the city. We, we plan on spending a long time there just to, to, just to encourage more people to, 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 to get a couple bucks in their pocket. I think it's wrong. And people are going to turn their houses into, into, into tourist hotels, whether you, not, you know it or not. It means that somebody's going to have to complain about a neighbor. And they call, we, we, you know, we want to get along with everybody. It's a separate source of friction. It's not fair uh, to community members. And I think for you guys to pass this thing would be a big mistake. Because I've seen Airbnb communities all over the world have been absolutely destroying residential areas. And you can read about them if you want, but I know Athens is in Venice, but you know, we, we've had entire cities, Barcelona being one, whole cities get destroyed and people don't live in neighborhoods anymore because of these rentals. They turn into hotel districts. I think you're really making, a, in my opinion, a major mistake 
by doing that. And, I, and I, you know, I love Athens. I've lived here a long time. I'm going to be here. My son lives here. We have family here. But, you know, there's enough partying around here. I have a right to live in a house and be in a quiet street if I want. I pay my taxes. I pay a lot of taxes, as a matter of fact. I always support taxes here. I always support services. And I think it's wrong. I think it's absolutely wrong. Um, R2, student zone, is fine. You know, let, let the students be. But, you know, we, we don't ask for much more than, than some, you know, re reasonable respect for privacy. Because I'm going to have it on two sides of me. If you say if you approve the one next door to me, they're never home, and the guy next door to me has a staff of 15 people taking care of his garden. You know who I'm talking about. I live right next door to that man. I can't, I can't think straight. My house shakes when he turns the volume up. He has bands out there and loud parties. That's what's going to happen in these places. I don't want to have to start regulating that stuff. I mean, you're more than welcome to to, to come come to my home. I have, have a glass of wine on the outside when the wedding's going on. It's abominable, and you know I don't want to have to stop people from. You know, enjoying themselves, but man, if you open the door, you are asking for trouble, and you cannot regulate it. Period. You can't regulate it. I don't think the city has the ability. I've been through the been through the mill here with the with the with, with the city councilor, and she was very nice. And I, I called I, I called the code office about it, and they were good. They took it off the website, but they still have a picture of a wedding on the website. They said, you know, they said, well, talk to us. It's bull. You know, period. An absolute period. We have a nice neighborhood. We, we have great neighbors. There are wonderful people in this town and in this community. And I, I really think you're making a big mistake, big, big mistake, by opening up what little residential areas we have left of this sort of this sort of crap, to be honest with you. Right. It really upsets me, and, and I can't do anything about it. I don't have to call the cops all the time. Okay. Pain in the ass. Awesome. It's not my job. The cops have better things to do than worry about noise. And you're asking them to, to deal with this garbage. I mean, really, just where people want to make a couple bucks in their pocket. Okay. I think it's wrong. And you can't regulate it. And if you open up a can of worms, man, you're going to rubber stamp the, the annual permits, which is what this thing says. It's a big mistake. Okay. okay. Thank right. you very much. Okay. Um, when you come to the uh, podium, Mr. if Chairman. you would. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Sir, uh, can I ask you a question for the sure. record? Okay. Uh, just so that we're aware. Um, uh, I, I think we're pretty much aware of the house that you're talking about. Are you on the west side of the street as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, many of the streets for the Planning Commission, or many of the, the properties for the Planning Commission's knowledge here on that side of the street, um, the back half of the property is outside of the city limits. Uh, and you know, that's been a challenge in the past with being able to... The house is in the front. Where they, where they do their stuff is in the city side. Sure. There's a tiny little place of Athens Township where I pay less tax on. It's like the last 10 feet of my property. Sure. Do you think that the res uh, residents in that area would be interested in annexation just to remove that problem uh, from the, uh, uh, from the it's, situation? It's not a problem. Um, it, it's going to be. If, if it's a problem, then it's fine. You know, uh, it's fine with me. I, I think that to me is an academic question. My tax might go up a little bit. It's fine. I don't mind paying taxes. I really don't mind paying taxes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a good guy here. Um, yeah, I don't mind. If that's what it is, that's fine with me. So one of the challenges that we had on the west side of the city with Numberfest uh, for a number of years is our inability to enforce the noise ordinance due to the fact that it sits outside of the city limits. Yeah, Only the back side of our property, the way, the way we're zoned is that there's a little strip. When I bought the lot I built there a couple of years ago, I built there with the idea of living here. And it's an existing neighborhood. It's, it, we had to get a zoning variance and it went through the, you know, people were very nice about it. There's a little strip of land on the East, what's that? On the west side, on the west side, that's a little tiny little strip of land that's outside city limits. And if you want to rezone, it's fine with me. I don't care. It actually wouldn't be zoning; it would be annexation. That's fine. Whatever you want to call it, it's fine. It doesn't affect. Do you us think your all. neighbors would agree? Uh, I don't. Know. Normally, it takes a you know kind of a majority of the property. I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Well, I know a friend of mine lives on top of Pleasant Hill, and they would not pave the last ten feet of the drop of the street because it was. Non-jurisdiction, big to do about. It. They finally got paved. I don't know who did it. They annexed. It was annexed. Yeah. It was annexed. Okay, that took care of that problem. I mean, if you want to annex it, it's fine with me. I mean, I really have not discussed this with other neighbors. I mean, I don't. Uh, you know, I think the tax is going to be very negligible because it's unimproved property. Uh, so we, we we back up on the. Um, you know, we already have high noise in our area because we back up on the highway, and there's no sound protection there. And most communities have sound protection across 33. We don't have that there, which is okay. You know, I knew that going in, but we've already got a noise issue from that. So, uh, yeah, it's fine. You want to annex, annex. Fine with me. 
I mean, you know, please, you know, if it helps us, helps the situation, yeah, sure. increase you. my tax. I'll pay my tax just to keep to keep the place quiet, and yeah. reasonable. That's all. I'm asking. For, the, for the people coming up to the podium, if you could try to confine yourself to about three minutes, since most of you have been here before, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. I'm Jan Hodson. I live at 45 Graham Drive. Um, I, I just want to sort of add something to what you were just talking about. I think that annexing it might be a good idea only because I've heard that used as an excuse for certain behavior in that area. We can do this because you guys can't say anything about it. That's been said in our neighborhood. Um, first of all, um, Again, an R1, we all thought it was owner-occupied long-term rental. We love that. That's what we, that's why we bought there. And that's, I think, our promise from the city zoning is that we were going to live in an R1. That's what an R1 was. We were very happy that you took the tourist homes out of an R1. But it seems like now what's happened is even though you removed the tourist homes, you've sort of opened the back door for actually a tourist home to happen again because of what we have talked about. There's no real way to tell when somebody starts a short-term rental in your neighborhood, if they're living there, if they're going to ever be there, and then you've opened the door. So what you've done on one hand is shut down the tourist homes. What you've done on the other hand is still say that a short-term rental is okay in an R1. And I just want to talk quickly about the Affordable Housing Commission. The city is supposedly for establishing affordable housing for residents. Many of the little houses in our neighborhood would be great starter homes for people. We'd like to see that considered instead of people thinking, oh, let's just start a little short-term rental there. We're not going to have to worry about, you know, having a, a you know, selling that house. Um, it just seems that there are places all over town, and I've said this to you before, and R1, just keep one, keep one residential area where we can count on it being owner-occupied or long-term rental. Thanks. Thank you. Someone else care to come up? <clears throat> Joan Kurnansky, 56 Mile Street. Well, um, in the packet that we have, R0819, under R1 residential zone, one family. Um, number five under B. I, I, I would propose you remove the comment in red. Rentals for any duration must be annually permitted because by saying any duration, I'm assuming, unless you can correct me, maybe I'm wrong, that that means short-term rentals. Is that correct? Not member stem. Mm -hmm. Rentals for any permission or duration would have to be permitted. And that means short term yeah, rentals. Be, I mean, if any rental would be permitted. So, in other words, what you're doing is allowing short term rentals in R1 neighborhoods, correct? Mm -hmm. You've got to say it out loud. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I the mean, mayor's going to say this, and everybody on board is going to say this, right? Are you asking me a question I'll have you to answer? Yes. Okay, so I'll go ahead and answer. You know, this compromise position uh, was one that the administration recommended to this, to this body um, as a way that we think we can best enforce provisions in Title 29 uh, to include the, no more than three unrelated people, um, all the parking requirements, uh, the requirements associated with, uh, you know, ground fault circuit interrupters and exit, uh, uh, exit signs and, and anything else necessary uh, to have a rental uh, on short-term rentals. But in this instance, yeah, short-term rentals would be permitted in an R1 for, uh, for people who have less than, or three or less unrelated, unrelated people. Well, I think that's a big mistake, and I'm really disappointed. Um, I, I, just, I can't even hardly speak at this point. But, and so if that is then the case, my next concern is that the violations that apply to a long-term rental are the same as written in code. I, we don't exactly have it, and I, I don't have the documents with me. Going through the court process, Etc. Etc. I know how long that takes. I've seen it happen, right? 
So now we're going to have um, an egregious situation in a neighborhood because you have allowed it if it gets passed through the Planning Commission and City Council. And then, in my neighborhood, I'm going to have that situation that's going to take, I don't know, so maybe somebody from the code office or the city planner can address this, how long? Months to get addressed? And then this situation continuously goes on? Uh, no, so you ha really haven't thought this out. If you're going to allow this, like you propose, which I think is just, just cutting us to the quick, those of us who live in the neighborhoods, in the R1 neighborhoods, if you're going to do this, you have got to cover our backs. You have got, I, haven't, I know you've read all the articles, right? And so you're going to allow these things to go on and on and on and not have special violation requirements for these specific things. You have done us a disservice. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Does someone else care to come up? Joan Saffron, 36, Utah Place. Um, <clears throat> I feel very strongly about not allowing any short-term rentals in R1 neighborhoods for many of the same reasons articulated by the previous people who were up here, so I won't repeat those. But we moved from the county where we had been paying F and city taxes but never got a chance to vote on anything in the city for 35 years. We've been in town now for five years and we chose our neighborhood specifically to have a true residential section. Please, please, please don't take that away from us. We know that Athens is a sort of unique place. The likelihood of having um, grown-up tourists who are just going to come eat in our restaurants or spend money on Court Street is not great. What we're going to have are student parties on the 10 big weekends a year. And if those are allowed in residential neighborhoods with people saying, landlords saying, we can have um, rentals for a couple of weekends uh, a month that will get us as much as we could get if we were renting for six months or a year, the nature of our neighborhoods is going to change. We came, as did most people in our one neighborhoods, for a specific reason, to be among other long-term residents. And as soon as you allow any kind of short-term rentals in R1 zones, those neighborhoods are destroyed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would someone else care to come up and speak? Black, 124 Morris Avenue, in the city here in Athens. Um, I think what we have right now is an uncontrolled situation for short-term rentals. And this is an attempt by the city to fix that. So what I'm hearing from folks is the concern that this opens up things, but it really what it does is it, it permits them and makes it so the city can actually enforce it. Right now, there is no way for the city to enforce any restrictions on short-term rentals in R1 zones. It's happening now. We've heard stories up here at the podium through this process from a couple people and at the town hall meeting um, of examples of that. So it's already happening, and the only way to fix that is to do what the city is trying to do here so that they can then regulate those situations and control that. Uh, I think the city is doing the right thing for the most part. I'm still a little gray on a couple implications with the changes here, but uh, it does seem like they're doing the right thing. And I think that the, the Planning Commission's consideration here is that uh, the city needs tools to be able to regulate short-term rentals and that this seems to be the right approach. 
Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Member Stone. Um, if, if I could have uh, Co-Director uh, Riggs uh, talk about the, um, uh, the contract we re recently initiated to monitor um, short-term rental uh, websites. Yeah, we, we actually uh, currently have a, it's really hard to find out where these, uh, where these rental units are. Um, so uh, what we did was we looked into a, uh, a corporation called Host Compliance, where they'll we'll contract with, the, with this company uh, to review, to scan the web, scan the internet, and they look at over 50 websites relate specifically for short-term rentals. They will uh, locate those properties, pinpoint the addresses for us. Uh, it'll also analyze the data um, to find out, you know, how uh, and if we're affecting the uh, housing affordability and availability in, in the area. It's still going to take me a few weeks to get this uh, in, uh, in place and operational, um, but we do, have, we do have something that's going to help us find out what's going on in our community. Uh, and and this, uh, this contract, I think, is going gonna, is gonna to be really helpful for us. It's basically a subscription for you. Yeah, it's an annual here. subscription. Uh, it's web-based, so it doesn't actually affect anything in our city. They give us monthly reports of all of the, uh, the uh, um, short-term rental units that they can find, because most short, or all short-term rentals use the Internet for, for, um, for publishing their, their, uh, their vacancies. Uh, so we think we can find almost all of them in, the, in our community with, with this software. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Is there uh, a question directed to uh, Mr. Riggs? Uh, go ahead. Um, uh, Joan Kornansky. Uh, I guess my question is, um, if you find um, um, properties that are being <coughs> no longer have a permit, do not have a permit, and are utilizing um, their house for short-term rental of any kind in an inappropriate way, obviously. What's the enforcement on that? Well, one of the things we know is that we don't, um, um, we don't really have any data right now on how long uh, people are, are renting during their short-term rentals for. Um, Chapter 29 actually allows uh, resident uh, residents in, a, in an R1 to R3 uh, to rent their properties out for short time, less than six months. Um, this will this will give us an opportunity to see if they if they are actually doing it for more than six months. Then they then they wouldn't uh, meet the uh, the, the uh, Title 29 um, that does allow them to do short term rentals in an R1 zone at this time. So I mean, this is a catch for anybody that's doing a short-term rental, the service that you're using, right? Yes. You're proposing to use, that's right? What, yes, we hope. I haven't seen any of the, uh, the uh, information back from the company. We did, we did uh, get it started, and they said it would be a couple of weeks before we could actually start to get any data from them. So we hope to get this in, in place at the first of the year. It would be a great time for us to do that. So if we took out the six... The six months from Title 29, which is one of the proposals, um, and we did not add short-term rentals or any whatever you, how, I forget the wording, then you could legitimately uh, find all those short-term rentals, B&Bs or uh, Airbnbs, and we could then do a clean slate if they're renting for more than six months. So they are, they, they. Oh, wait, but whoa, 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 okay. So what about, that's not short term then. Airbnb. So the way I, the way I read the, the, this is that they can do uh, a rental and then for a week and then stop for a couple weeks until they get to a point where they've rented for more than six months. Um, and at that point they're in violation. And this way we can check with this software, we can check and see uh, which ones are doing that. It's really hard to do at this point. We can do that now. We're, that's what's happening now. That's what's happening now, yeah. This way we'll be able to find out who's doing it and be able to manage it. But it's only going to reveal once someone has been renting for six months, correct? That's the only way I know how to do it, yes. 
other than checking with online at the rental sites or I mean people do it all the time yeah. Um, yeah. I when I talked to the uh, code office in Indiana Pennsylvania the woman said to me oh we check the online rental sites all the time we have two B&B &B establishments in our town and we keep a close eye on them they haven't caused any problems yet so that's a town of 13,000 with a college okay. population. And yet in Athens, somehow we've never been able to do that. I, I guess I, I find it puzzling. But thank you. I appreciate your effort. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on. Uh, was there someone else who cared to speak? Mary Abel, 48 Strathmore. I'm speaking specifically on item number five with the addition of the last sentence there. <clears throat> what this basically has done is to set up short-term rentals in an R1 area, thereby creating a business within that R1. It also can become a backdoor approach to establishing a, a potentially a, sh a fewer occupancy, perhaps tourist home without a definition. And I would remind you that at the public hearing, the majority of those people who spoke were in opposition to having a short-term rental in an R1. Now, there's been some discussion here about this is the way the city can control this. And I would say, part of the problem is that it has been going on and it hasn't been controlled. And when people buy a house in an R1, it becomes all of our responsibilities to know what the definition of an R1 is and what the legal responsibilities are there. I question too um, that article number five refers to the number of renters that are going to be allowed in a short term rental. The same as in a long term. How are you going to check that and enforce it? The reason we have three unrelated people right now is because the city of Athens, many years ago, went through this process and there's an Ohio Supreme Court ruling that upheld the city on the number of people that could be in that particular unit. So it seems to me that knowing that there are short-term rentals operating in an R1, they haven't been controlled. We know they're happening. And to me, when we know that's happening, then there should be a cease and desist order because otherwise it would appear that the city is ignoring its own regulations for those in an R1. I understand many of these people we know, they're your friends, they're my friends. But the fact of the matter remains is we are in an R1 area, which is a firm residential zone. I also understand that this legislation has been going through the process for quite a while. Believe me, I know better than anyone how long it takes for some kind of legislation to go through the process, but when you do this, that's your role as an elected leader. And I think maybe there should have been wider conversation and inclusion into the process. I don't recall that any of this was discuss in any kind of neighborhood forum when it was going through. So I am asking that you members of the Planning Commission really consider removing that last sentence in item number five. Otherwise, I think you're setting yourselves and our city and residents up for absolutely something that is really not going to be able to be enforced. And then we're going to have a situation that is going to take on a whole character of a different matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else who uh, wishes to speak? Uh, sure, come on to the podium. State your name, please. And your address. Jack Stoffer, 69 Elmwood. Um, I'd like to remind you before I get started here, that public meeting, 14 people spoke against, three people spoke for. We turned in a petition with 250 some signatures in opposition. When I speak, I'm speaking only about R1. Any words that I speak will be in R1. 
First of all, thank you for your consideration in dropping tourist homes from the City Council's proposal. Again, thank you. These folks that spoke before me have presented facts and research, and I hope you folks take to heart because the taking of property rights is a serious decision that will have an adverse effect on the folks in all of our R1 neighborhoods. I speak to you not from research, but a common sense and tell it like it is approach. Anything and everything I say does not reflect on any of the good citizens in this room that spoke before me. These are my feelings and my thoughts. I have asked in writing to city council on more than one occasion, the mayor on one occasion, and to date have received no answers to some very simple common sense questions. How do you believe the short-term rentals will enhance the quality of life in an R1 zone? Remains unanswered. How do you think these short-term rentals will adversely affect the quality of life in an R1 zone? That remains unanswered. It seems to me that the Near East Side and the Far East Side would be the most likely affected. Could you please share your thoughts on that? That remains unanswered. I take note of the introduction of nonprofit organization 501c3 and wonder why and how this is relevant to any existing or proposed future legislation. I would like to think and ask you folks, what are the answers to these common sense questions? Please give your comments after I finish and take my seat. I believe we, the general public and residents of R1, are entitled to hear your answers and reasoning for attempting to crush our dreams of living in a complete R1 district as the code currently provides. Now I will quote Chris Fall from Wednesday, October 19, 2016. The headline is Athens Council Adopts Bed and Breakfast Regulations. The Planning Commission is looking at R1 and R2 right now. I would suggest to the Planning Commission that they maybe do an ad hoc committee to all get all the stakeholders together to discuss this. We will work through this so people have their property rights and people have the conditions that they move into their neighborhoods with all respected and protected. Stand by. Seems that certainly someone or something has happened behind the public's eyes that has changed the opinion that we, the citizens, are no longer entitled to our existing property rights. I am not aware of any state laws changing, and this is what you want from your home rule? I have tried to the best of my ability to get elected officials to answer and explain why we are no longer entitled to the rights we got when we purchased our properties in our R1 zone. Yes, folks, we all did our due diligence and chose to purchase homes and live in a peaceful, quiet R1 neighborhood. I ask this commission to please keep the word of the existing code and not use the progressive views to erode the general public's property rights. This may be about money to you and what or whoever has gotten to you, but the general public is about maintaining our quality of life. Please try to show some integrity, character, conscience, and not fold to whatever political pressure you are under by whoever or whatever that is. Since no one, the mayor, the council, or this commission will explain it, it leaves me wondering if 30 Utah, okay, who are on, 30 Utah, that's an address in the city of Athens, is not the driving force behind these demands. This, this proposal is effing bullshit. Okay, excuse me. Um, you're, it's, you're, it's America, you're out of order now. It's America, and, uh, and no. I got the right to speak. Your, your minutes are please up. Thank you very much. All, excuse me, sir. Please represent the public and not special interests. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like, you know, we have, uh, throughout the uh, few months that we've conducted 
discussions about this. I think we've kept things to a, a pretty civil manner. Um, and I really speaking as the chair, I do resent coming up here and disparaging people who are among the administration, residents, whoever, uh, Mr. Stauffer, in suggesting that there's some sort of ulterior motives. And I think that's, that's a problem going forth. And I would really expect that people do respect the process here, the fact that you are being listened to several times over, and uh, that we keep this in a uh, respectful manner, please. I did not disparage anyone I told the facts no, you're, the way you're, they have unfolded. You're, you're making unfounded uh, assumptions here. You're laying things out in terms of uh, The simple questions that I've asked of my council members and my mayor and my planning commission go unanswered. They're simple, common sense questions that have simple common sense answers that need to be applied Thank you very much. to the situation we're addressing. We understand that. Uh, if there's any other type of uh, outburst like that, you'll immediately lose your time on the, uh, the podium. Thank you very much going forth. Ms. Hollow. My name is Betty Hollow. I live at 31 Maplewood Drive. <clears throat> I only want to say a couple of sentences to support what Ms. Abel has already said. Um, when I saw that you had removed the tourist home, I was delighted because I think that's just um, devastating to have such a thing. But when I look at uh, item five here, and we can have three adult renters in an unregulated, an, a non-resident home, it seems very much like a tourist home, only with fewer people. That's better than six people or five people, but it's still an unsupervised situation where you would have three people or three people and a family in an R1 district, which we're hoping not to have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Al? I'm Alan McMillan, um, 209 East State Street, 205 East State Street. Um, first off, uh, you know, we live in a sharing economy now. All this is new to us, all of it. And it's evolving, it's gonna to continue to evolve. You know, not too distant future, we're gonna be calling for a pod to come and take us up to Court Street for a night out and not have to drive because it's autonomously driven. There's gonna to continue to be challenges. It's not taking anyone's rights away. It's about, it's about how do we evolve under a changing world. I think the process, um, I appreciate it. I appreciate the chance you've had these forums and you've had the public meetings. Um, and I think it's been a thoughtful approach. Um, I'm here, I'm, the people who are opposed to this are very well organized. And bravo, I think everyone uh, has their opinion and, and I've tried to listen very carefully to everybody's concerns. I don't believe the sky is falling. I don't believe that there's gonna be no upside and tons of downside. I don't believe we have enough hotel spaces. Notice we don't have anyone from the hotel community saying, oh, don't do this, it's gonna take some of our business away. <laughs> it's just a fantasy. You know, because right now, there isn't enough hotel space on big weekends and, and that kind of stuff, and we do lose. I don't buy off that there's no economic opportunity. I believe there is, and uh, we certainly need it as a community. I respect landowner rights but there's landowner rights evolved with both sides of this equation. So I appreciate what you've done. You know, and it seems that the original proposal and the adjustments you're making, but the original proposal was like a reaction to people being concerned that this was gonna be horrible. The, the owner has to be there or live there, or it has to be right next door. I mean, it's pretty heavily regulated to make sure that it is a, a process that doesn't deteriorate neighborhoods. The fact that we're going to be Barcelona and we're uh, and the the Near East Side is going to turn into the restaurant, uh, the uh, the hotel district. 
I just don't think that's consistent with uh, reality in our small town. I think this can be done thoughtfully. I think this can be done in a manner that the, uh, uh, the community thrives in this. And uh, I think it was a well thought out proposal and I appreciate the time you've done uh, for tweaking it. One other thing I'm gonna say is I live on East State Street. And for, and we're in an R1. But, but let me tell you something, the traffic noise and all that goes with living on the main street certainly doesn't feel like it's nestled in the middle of a neighborhood. You know, so the thing is, we go with give and take, and uh, we'll continue to do that, but I appreciate your time, and I see I'm out of time, and just uh, um, I trust that you'll do a good job going forward. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Okay. Um, we'll just take one more at this point. Um, I'd like to disagree with that point. And um, it, wherever there have been um, Airbnb set up, the regulations have been almost impossible to um, regulate. I mean, it's impo impo impossible to really uh, look at them. Um, in terms of website, um, had we been able to, we can't know who's advertising where and when, uh, because this whole thing with um, uh, with the Russian trolls and everything, we can't regulate that. We can't regulate the internet. We can't do those sorts of things that you're proposing. Um, but everywhere, I know, everywhere there's been problems with short-term rentals in residential areas, even where cities have banned them, there's been lots of problems. And I think when you have, when you have a regulation like you're proposing, it opens up the door for more of it. And uh, I think it's I think it's not a smart thing to do. And it's just that everywhere you read about Airbnbs, and the research is very strong on this too. I just that's my only point. So, um, and, and going back to yeah, the world's changing. You're right, but the world has enough to change everything. Uh, it, it, you know, you don't have to change where we live and how we interact in the community. We have 70, 65 percent rentals in this town. It's not a whole lot of us have owner occupied units here. We have the right to some privacy and peace and neighborhood communities as well. So. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Logue, from a city planning perspective and a comprehensive plan that will be probably brought to us very shortly, um, what is your take in terms of the R1 <coughs> nature of the short-term housing? Um, <clears throat> well, the first thing I think is that um, uh, demand on any given night for somebody to stay in an Airbnb in the city of Athens, Ohio is very minimal. Most of our hotels on any given night um, are less than half full. Um, so I, I'm not, I would not expect that a lot of people would um, all of a sudden immediately start renting out their homes to Airbnb, Airbnb or anything like that. Uh, through the comprehensive plan, uh, we um, the comprehensive plan draft uh, is silent on this issue right now. Um, we didn't have any, there was no real discussions about it through the planning process, uh, uh, any real consensus as to move forward on this item or not. Um, there is some discussion about um, how to change and how to be more dynamic with our rental permit, with inspections and enforcement. Of course, we've heard those things for years now, and that's never going to change. Um, but then the other item is, like I said, I don't think, um, I don't think there's that much demand. I don't think a lot of people want to have people living in their homes for a short term or for a long term. Anybody in Athens who's got a single family home, they can keep two renters right now. Very few people do that, period. Um, and so to just allow somebody to, to have the opportunity to rent out their home does not mean that they're going to rent out their home. Um, it does give property owners more flexibility though. We've heard from a lot of people who, who uh, uh, say this would help them to make their mortgage payments. For example, they can rent out their house once a week, once a month, something like that, get in a couple hundred, a couple hundred dollars extra. That can, do, that can go a long way for somebody if they're on a fixed income or if they're on a high mortgage payment or something like that. So it can actually help them in many ways. Um, we do hear a lot about conversations about 75% of the city is rental. That is true. That being said, 40% of our city, four is our, our, largest from, our largest land use is single family residential. 40% of our city is single family residential. Almost 0% of our city is R2. 
it's it's very very small portion. You see anything yellow on that map is R2, actually less than that because there's a rezoning. Uh, there's very little R2 in our city. Of our rentals, um, about 90% of them or greater are within our R3 zone. So if we look at when we're, my, uh, my intern and I are actually trying to break down the numbers to get details on how many of our rentals are actually in R1 zones, but it's actually more in line with national averages, which is 75% of an R1 zone is, is uh, owner-occupied and 25% is rental. So uh, we're actually we're doing okay on that, and so expanding, allowing a little bit more flexibility is rental. I would not expect that, that we would see too much change, period. From a historical point, yeah. when people began to create zones around the country, 1900, yeah. 18, whatever, yeah. what was the, the philosophical thought of creating an R1? Um, well, the separation of uses is the historic purpose of zoning, and, that's, and uh, our, our zoning scheme is set up around the separation of use, uses. It's typically referred to as a Euclidean zoning, which um, is based on the, uh, the village of Euclid, the city of Euclid in Cleveland, uh, which had a U.S. Supreme Court case to uh, defend the, the, the rationale and the legal basis for zoning. Um, and in that situation, it was to separate residential from manufacturing so that you didn't have, they were, they were deemed incompatible uses and that a city under the police powers could, uh, zoning is an exercise of the police powers. Historically, uh, the separation of uses has been the um, overriding goal of zoning. Um, over the last two decades, though, there has been a lot of uh, planners, architects, land use professionals, and cities that have acknowledged that the separation of uses has actually created a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of problems in communities. Um, it, isolates, it isolates us from uh, business uses. Um, it, it, it requires us to drive everywhere. Um, parking requirements and all of those further complicate that equation. Um, and so a lot of cities are moving back from, are starting to shift less on separating uses and more on looking at how the city is designed. Um, so rather than saying we don't want, um, we don't want business in our R1 zones, if, we, if we're going to have a business in an R1 zone, we want it to look in this manner. Or we can have some business in an R1, but we don't want um, large scale business in our communities. And so that's, that's, that would be the trend I would expect. And, um, I don't think you asked me, but that would be the trend I would expect that the city. Right. Should be One of the as things as well. that I've noticed on my street is that uh, more families are starting to move back mm -hmm. with children. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is because people are trying to find enclaves where you know they feel safe to raise children and whatnot. Um, but uh, you know, and I know that uh, I'm selling my house as a matter of fact to somebody who's starting a, house, a family. Mm -hmm. So you know, my concern would be what effect. Uh, allowing more short-term housing, sh short-term rentals in the R1 would be in terms of obstructing uh, family life actually starting to regenerate itself in Athens. Are, are you having that kind of experience in other neighborhoods where, where children, families with children are starting to move back? We, we're seeing a generational change, I think, and that's, it's, that's typical about every 20 to 30 years, you know. Um, 20 years from now, my, ch my child will be full grown, and um, uh, yeah. probably 30 years from now, I'll be looking to sell my home, uh, and then a new family, I ideally, then a new family comes in and takes it over. Um, so there, there is a, that cyclical um, activity is happening. I, I don't, anecdotal, anecdotally at least, I know in my neighborhood, um, uh, there's a lot more families with children today than there were 10 years ago, talking to um, neighbors who have been in that neighborhood for a long time. Um, uh, your comment or your concern about how that might impact that, I'm, I, I don't, uh, I do not know. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor? I need a point of clarification. Um, you know, we always talk about the percentage of housing stock in the city of Athens that are rentals. We hear about it all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The conversation that's not had is, and maybe you can answer this, what's the percentage of rental units in R1 neighborhoods um, and more importantly, uh, or equally important, what constitutes a housing unit? Because when I look at things like Carriage Hill, or I look mm -hmm. at uh, River Park Towers, or I look at River Gate, or I look at Coates Run, any of these large apartment complexes that have dwelling units in them, right. is that counted in as part of the percentage of the city's overall housing? Yes. 
So, yeah. so it depends on what you mean by how is it counted, though. But yes, there, if you look at Carriage Hill, it'll tell you how many permitted occupants it has, for example. And so that is a unit of housing in the city of Athens that factors into the percentage that we always hear with 75% or 80% of our housing being rental units. Yes, but I'm not sure if your is your question is it considered one unit or is it considered m many hundred units? I'm asking if it's considered many units. I believe it's considered many units. And, and yeah. so then back to my original question or my first question, and that is in an R1 in the R1 neighborhoods, do we know what percentage of those that we do is you know typical single family single family homes? How many of those are rental units percentage wise? We are we are trying to calculate that. Right now, but it, but uh, from preliminary information, it looks like it's closer to about 25 to 35 percent, okay, somewhere in that earlier. field. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Um, I want to open the uh, floor up at this Benny point. Benny Hollow knows the number of oh. east side. I want to comment and answer to your question, not in terms of percentages, but in terms of numbers. I live on the east side, and the number of people who live on the east side, and I have access to these. Um, reported rental units. Now, there may be some that are not reported, but my neighborhood, which I consider from Bovina, on um, whatever it is, to East State Street and East Street down to home. I don't know how many actual housing units there are, but I know that there are 179 rentals in that home on East Street. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, Cut off discussion, move discussion from uh, the audience to uh, the commission since we're starting to run out of time. Um, does anybody care to, from the commission, care to make any comments at this time? Ms. Sem uh, com Member Zemter? Not a comment as much as maybe a question for the administration of is there some compelling legal impediment or other compelling argument that would prevent us? I mean, I certainly understand the need to to have some regulation of this, but is there some compelling reason that that regulation could not incorporate limits based on zoning districts? So eliminating it from certain zone, zoning districts, eliminating short-term rentals altogether. We did it already with bed and breakfast. Right. Member Stone. I'm, you know, I'm an attorney, but it's probably a better question to direct to the law director. I know that um, you know our approach so far to enforcement actions surrounding short-term rentals that are advertised via Airbnb, VRBO, or any other number of websites that need to uh, wait until legislation gets passed uh, in order to take action against somebody because uh, you know it's unclear how it would come out uh, in court if we were to go and say, okay, you're violating XYZ section of code, and, and then say, well, you know, no, we're not. And we haven't had that, that, that uh, we haven't had that happen yet. But we could, if we're changing the code already, we could specifically spell out that short-term rentals are permissible only in certain zoning districts. And that uh, would yeah. We, yeah, we could. Um, and then we just got to, whether it's enforceable or not, I don't know. You know, if, if, if it were to go to court, it has not gone to court in this, you know, locally yet, to my knowledge. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's already permissible in Bs and R3s, I guess, which raises another question that I had, which not to derail this. How how many uh, short-term rentals are there in our R3 neighborhoods? We don't know. It doesn't really it's not, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have to permit them. So we wouldn't have counted them. Yeah, correct. Uh, members, uh, I have a couple of questions that are kind of more general, and that is, it, I know there's a lot of rankle that I've noticed, and I can't imagine why the person who owns it doesn't consider it, but the non-conformities are a problem, I think, that where um, a property was a residential property for years, and then all of a sudden it's become a party house. I mean, I... I don't, I don't have anything against the owner, but I think that if I were the next door neighbor, I would be pretty peeved at the noise and everything else that happens. And I, and I don't know that we can even deal with that because it's a nonconformity, even if we pass this on either side, or unless they, they make a, a big 
change. The other thing is, I do think that people have a view of rentals that are either Carriage Hill or something else, but in my neighborhood, on Franklin, on Columbia, which is a noisy road, and it's our one, and, but it does have rentals. And the rentals are houses that are rented and they are not obviously different from the others. And um, I think there's one that you can tell because of the car in the front yard. But other than that, there's a problem with, there is no problem with rentals. In fact, if I go down, I used to be third ward rep, and the people on Franklin and Grosvenor were never upset about having student rentals next door to them. We heard a testimony from a person on State Street who said, I don't mind having the students living next door to me as long as I know who they are, when they are, when they're coming, when they're going, where they're parking their car, blah, blah, blah. So if they park in my driveway, I can tell them to move, and so on and so forth. That's a neighborhood concept. But what we're talking here is kind of a business intrusion into the neighborhood, in my opinion. But um, I am willing to talk about that. But Frank, but the mixed neighborhood is a, is a stable neighborhood in Athens. What I would like to see is under five on rentals, the one that Mary Abel has talked about. I mean, that's a statement of fact. I don't think it's a segue into developing B&Bs all over town. I don't see how it could be because we have to permit all of the rentals in order to accomplish some kind of Control, that's probably not the right word, regulation. And uh, you know, I really appreciate what happened in the intervening period between the two events, but I still would like to see some protection of the R1. That's where my, li my, my line is right there. I, don't, I think people see five rentals as being a segue, and I'm not sure it is. It's, what we really want to do is pick up those places where people are going on sabbatical maybe, or other are using their house to rent, to give their friend for a year or swap. I think that probably needs to be with the closeness of the houses and the rest. That probably needs to be in the code. We need to beyond what it is with the regulations as they are. So I'm in favor of if we can doing something about the single family dwelling requirement in R1, either an owner occupant or no. I mean, I'm not talking about the owner-occupant would solve all the problems. I, and, you know, I think you can go back and say, GB, they've had so many lawsuits about it, but I sent many of you, probably not successfully. The Airbnb sued Boston in federal court, challenging the ordinance aimed to discourage from converting houses and apartments into de facto hotels. Now, I've been in Boston. The first time I stayed in a B&B, &B and I was staying in a de facto hotel, and I didn't realize it was pretty scary because of the lock situation and so on. In addition to requiring the host register with the city, the ordinance restricted short-term rentals to spaces where the owner is present and require that... Airbnb share its information. Those are both things that have just recently come out. We're doing this just at a fortuitous time. It may have taken a while, but it has. So I really think that in the R1 zones and in your neighborhood, for example, which is around the corner from me, the neighbors are upset with the student that live and park their car for sale on the street. But what do they do? They go to the owner who lives in town and they say, shape that, those guys up. Now, I'm not sure he has, but I think they think about it. And in your neighborhood also, people are coming from Columbus with cash in their pocket and buying houses. And that's scary as well. So we've got to grab hold of this thing and control it. I mean, I don't know necessarily believe in control, but I believe we need to do something to sharpen it up. And I can see no better place to have it than in code, because I think code has a thing on the public safety. And that's what we're after, right? We're not trying to destroy capitalism. We're not trying to promote it. We're trying to protect public health and safety. That's what zoning's about. That's it. Well, I think when we're talking about a sharing economy and things of that nature, what I'm hearing is that there's parts of this town for everybody, or that's the theory. There should be parts of this town for But you're not, if you don't really uh, strengthen the R1 uh, requirements as far as owner-occupied, short-term rentals, um, I, I don't see that that's giving that slice of the pie to people who want to be away from a lot of the activity that might be taking place around town. That they want to be able to raise a family there, they want to know who the neighborhood is, um, and there should be a piece of the town for those people as well. 
Um, you know, I, I, all the people here who uh, really uh, go after the environment and you know the ecosystems and whatnot. You know, and I think R1 is a is a fragile part of that Athens ecosystem, and that's the thing then that we need to be preserving, and you know where where mixtures can be made. That's fine, but I think that there should be an ultimate uh, notion of what the R1 is to this town and the protections that we need to keep that thriving in terms of family life, uh, in terms of just having some normalcy within the town in a, in a, in a community that has a high bit of transition and people moving in and out, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of, there are things in here that there's more clarity that the administration has added, which I applaud. Um, but I would like to see a little stronger um, protection of the R1 neighborhoods. So, you know, where, again, the idea of owner-occupied, uh, it's, it's probably easier, I think, in some ways, some people have already said it, it's probably easier just to have an outright, there's, there's no short-term housing uh, within an R1 because the city provides in other R zones the ability to do that. Mr. Chairman, sure. and, and for Member Bain, if I could ask, just from a point of clarity, if we're going to try to work on this more, um, which is what I think I hear you saying, um, you know, unless we were to move to vote on this particular iteration of it today. Um, currently, the code reads, the keeping of not more than two renters by a resident owner or the keeping of not more than three adult renters plus related children by a non-resident owner are permitted uses in an R1. So, and that's then it, status that's status quo. Right. And then our housing code says that you have to get a permit if you're renting for more than six months. But you don't have to get a permit if you're renting to anybody for less than six months. So currently, if I have a house and I rent to two renters and I live there, mm -hmm. I don't have to get a permit right now. And so, like, if I rent out a bedroom you know, on Airbnb or VRBO or what have you and I live there in the house, it's completely acceptable under our code currently. Are you saying that we should we should go ahead and, 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 and basically continue to allow that, but then reduce our um, duration of, um, you know, what constitutes needing a rental permit down to to, to everything and then uh, or to, to any any type of renting would require a permit? Is that what you're saying? I would say that because they, they need those protections. They need the ground fault. They need the others. So cost of doing business is what I think it sure. is. Sure. Sure. So, so to kind of take it a step further, should there be a definition of a short-term rental period? And, and I kind of go back from the, from the business, uh, I guess business perspective in the right direction, but you know, I, I, I kind of see, you know, that, that, you know, I, I'm renting out my spare room on, on uh, VRBO or, or, or Airbnb. Um, that's, a, that's a function somewhat like a business. So, and, and I would contend that's transient and, and those mm -hmm. users should be paying transient guest tax. And so I guess I, I, I would say if we were to do that, we have to have some sort of definition of short-term rental so as to be able to collect the transient guest tax from those people who currently are allowed to do it but aren't having to do any kind of permit because of the, that uh, below six-month limitation. So I guess I would just ask for, uh, for input on language from members if, if we want to change this again so that we can achieve those couple goals. Well, again, but do you want short-term rental in the R1, in which case, yeah. if I'm understanding it. But it currently it, is, if you live there. You right. Can, you can rent to two people um, that are not, if you're a resident owner, you can rent to two. It says right now, the keeping of not more than two renters by a resident owner mm -hmm. is currently permissible, absolutely permissible, and you don't have to get a permit, uh, a rental permit under our housing code because it's less than six months. So it's currently legal to rent out a spare room in your house on Airbnb for two people, and it's currently in our code. Now, do we want to further restrict it so that you can no longer do that? And I mean, is that what you're, what you're recommending? Uh, that's where I'm going for, yes. Hmm. Okay. I would go so that, that would take property rights uh, from, from a current R1 person. And I think we have had some discussion about um, um, the eroding of property rights. For sure, but I, I think cities... 
on occasion do take property rights away from somebody for the for the greater good. So that's that's how I'm seeing, you know, protecting the R1 from that standpoint. I understand. Okay. Okay. I I still think it was a good faith effort, and that line is being maybe misinterpreted. And I think we could almost save it if we just renumbered it and put it on a separate line. Rentals of any duration must be annually permitted per provisions. I mean, that says nothing about R1, 2, or 3. All it says is that. Well, but it's listed under R1. Yeah, it's listed under R1. We'd have to, we, what we would do is just strike it here, and then in, in, in Title 29, we would, we would um, We'd have, to, we'd have to modify 29. Too much 29. paper, guys. Too much paper. All right. I can see that point, but I want it moved. Okay. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. I mean, I'm all for strengthening code and strengthening that office. And I think this is the way to do it and stop letting people slip by without getting smoke detectors and CO detectors and other things when, when we're having them do the actual work. I mean, if you're talking about a long-term rental in an R1, I think that the community has, has said that that's not a big issue with them. I think it's, it's about the short term and who's coming in your neighborhood and going out, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that we'd like to work, I think, in agreement that this is going to be worked on? Uh, this was my best shot, and, right. and I guess I would ask the members of the commission if you want me to come back as a member of the commission with a um, with a modification. Please send send uh, instead of just spoken recommendations, some written re recommendations, and I can source it with the with the administration staff, and we can we can come back uh, and, and bring it before this body yet again. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else have any comment? All right. Um, let's, no, we've. We're, We're moving on to another subject now. Sorry. Just, uh, just give me a second. Give this gentleman a second, a second shot. He gave me a second shot. I've got 30 or 45 seconds. Well, I got bit the last time, Mr. Stauffer. Okay. 10 seconds. I've suggested this several times. Let your let your let your short-term rentals come. Let them be in all the B zones. Let them be in the R3 zones. Let them be in the R2 zones. You're giving those people additional privileges. Just don't give those additional privileges to the people in the R1 zone. The R1 zones won't be having anything taken from them. They will just be having restrictions. So the R1 zones, as they are, can go on and let the regular folks have the only thing they have to 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 retreat to, which is R1. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are no communications. Uh, well, let's see. To end this, I guess then we're, we're going to discuss this further. Um, and uh, I know that we'll probably try to get some uh, things in writing. For Mr. Stone, for Member Stone to consider, and uh, from me or for me, for uh, no, you. For, for you to consider, for, okay. for, for us all to consider. Thank you. Um, let's see. Report from the City Planner, Mr. Loeb. Uh, nothing, <clears throat> nothing additional to report this afternoon. I feel like we've all talked a lot, so okay. thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Riggs. Uh, nothing additional to. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, an opportunity for citizens to speak on. Uh, Items not covered with the agenda today. That's okay, Chairman. Okay, um, hey, moving on. And now, I'm sorry. Chairman. Yes. Uh, we, we forgot to mention there. there we may be uh, planning commissioners may expect uh, two Title 41 applications oh, coming January forward 2nd. for January 2nd's meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, announcements and other business. Uh, our next meeting will be uh, January 2nd, 2020, and with the. Uh, Work of the Athens City Planning Commission completed. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you.